Association football is the most popular outdoor sport in Britain. Thousands play and millions watch the game. Keenest of all are the youngsters, whose heroes are the famous professional footballers, and who dream of the day when they too, perhaps, may wear the colours of a famous club and hear the roar of the crowd. Everywhere in Britain you'll find boys playing football. Anywhere will do. On public playing fields where the young players learn the discipline of the game and the laws that govern it. In school yards. And even in the streets. Though street games are apt to finish suddenly, inconclusively. At many schools, older boys get special instruction, as at Highgate, where the Reverend Kenneth Hunt, once a famous Corinthian and England player, teaches the art of trapping the ball. With the sole of the foot, on the turn, with the inside of the leg. For ball control is essential to skillful play. Morris Edelston, English international, and Walter Winterbottom of Manchester United demonstrate other ways of trapping the ball to schoolboys during the holidays. Of being quick off the mark and keeping the ball under control when running. of hitting the ball properly. The wrong way can be painful. And through games like heading tennis, keeping the boys interested in learning the right way of bringing the head into contact with the ball. With the help of Jim Barry of Carnegie Physical Training College, the boys practice dribbling and running with the ball. He encourages both team spirit and competition by introducing these essentials of good football into a relay race. In the lecture room, Harvey Chadder, famous Corinthian and amateur international halfback, explains football tactics. In this case, defence countering attack. If the inside forward draws the defence, the outside forward will be left free and less covered by the right back. The lesson learnt in theory is then put into practice on the field. The inside left is attacking with the ball. He beats his covering half back and passes to the left wing. The right back tackles, but the winger centres the ball. But centre half and left back are covering the goal, and the goalkeeper clears. From these, the more gifted, more painstaking schoolboys, from the keener workers in industry, come the great professional footballers. Men in workshops and factories all over Britain spend their Saturdays and Sundays playing for their works teams, and many business firms nowadays provide special playing fields in their grounds for the use of their workers. Legend has it that many years ago, whenever a first-class football club in the North or Midlands wanted a player, the club manager just went to the nearest coal mine and shouted down the pit shaft. Sure enough, up would come a pit lad good enough to play in any first-class side. Nowadays, club managers seeking talent don't go to the pit. Instead, they go to the local football ground. Such men as Major Frank Buckley, manager of Notts County, and Eric Brooks, the well-known Manchester City and England winger, always ready to help young players, are only too willing to give advice and guidance to local colliery teams. will watch many a game hoping to find among these keen, vigorous youngsters just the young players who with care and coaching can become professional footballers. Many footballers have come from the pits, such as Harry Hubbock, present captain of Bolton Wanderers. 
Others have been the idols of schoolboys since the days when they themselves were schoolboy players. Like Twinkle Toes, Stanley Matthews, England's outside right and prince of dribblers. Or Tommy Lawton, the Chelsea and England centre forward. Other present day giants of football went to the game from their jobs. Like Frank Swift, England's goalkeeper, who was once a Blackpool boatman. And 10 goal Joe Payne, who has headed the list of goal scorers for several seasons, who came from a coal mine to become Chelsea's centre forward. Such are the heroes of Britain's schoolboys, who treasure their photographs of outstanding players, but prize above all the signatures of their special favourites. Throughout the football season, schoolboys throng to the league matches, the league championships being decided by points at the end of the season. But most of all, you'll see them at cup ties, played on a knockout system. For in the cup battles, there's always an outside chance that the small club may spring a surprise and lay low one of the more powerful teams. On this occasion, the cup competition was divided into two sections, South and North. In round one of the South Cup, Crystal Palace visit Chelsea at the famous Stamford Bridge ground. John Harris, Chelsea's captain, is centre-half for Scotland and son of a great footballing father. The referee calls the captains together and after a friendly handshake and the toss of a coin to decide ends, the match starts. Chelsea go on to beat club after club, supporters of the Royal Blue Shirts get more and more excited until their team reaches the last hurdle before the cup final, the semi-final. Semi-final cup matches are played on neutral grounds. West Ham United, a club with a great record, played Chelsea on the famous Tottenham Hotspur ground at White Hart Lane. the West Ham forwards and Black, the Chelsea goalkeeper, has some awkward shots to fend off. Chelsea. And that scrambled goal has given them the lead. West Ham can still save the day, but no, another Chelsea dash. This looks dangerous. Is it a goal? It is, and Chelsea have won. Victory over West Ham brings Chelsea to the cup final. Their opponents are Millwall, and the two will meet at Wembley Stadium, scene of all cup finals since 1924. Great crowds travel from near and far to see this game. To cheer Millwall, popularly called the Lions, or Chelsea, nicknamed the Pensioners. 
the two teams come onto the field together. Bill Wall in white shirts, led by their manager, Jack Cock, once a famous Chelsea player, and Chelsea, led by their manager, Billy Birrell, also an old footballer. A hundred thousand people have come to see the match. So has the King, with Mr. Will Cuff, president of the Football League, and Mr. George Allison, celebrated manager of the Arsenal team, the King greets the players of both teams. He has a word with Chelsea's manager, with their captain, John Harris, with Joe Payne, the centre forward, Ian Black, the goalkeeper, Danny Winter, the right back, and other members of the Chelsea team, including MacDonald, the outside left. It's a great day for Southern football enthusiasts. The vast crowds await the game, keyed up with excitement, wondering which team will win the coveted cup. Neither Millwall nor Chelsea has won the cup before. Mr. Reader of Southampton, an old player himself, is referee. The captains toss the coin, and Millwall wins the choice of ends. goal has a tonic effect in a game like this and Millwall are all out to get that goal. Here go Millwall's forwards again. Close shave for the Chelsea girl. But their defence holds, and at half time, neither team has scored. And while the players have the usual break, boys from Cadet Corps units give a gymnastic display and keep the great crowd entertained with their exhibition of perfectly timed physical exercises. But it's football that the spectators want to see. Ah, here are the teams again. Millwall kicks off and the second half has begun. Chelsea are after that cup-winning goal. Millwall's goalkeeper has some anxious moments. Chelsea keep pressing. Yes, here it is, it's a goal. And Chelsea have won the cup. Hard luck, Millwall. Well done, Chelsea. It's their great occasion. For the first time in their history, the captain of the team makes his way to the Royal Box to receive the cup. alike are delighted. At long last, the West London Club have won the Football Cup. Johnny Harris may well feel proud that he has captained the team this day. In the north of England, in the great centres of manufacture and industry, 
football plays an even greater part in the life of the people. In the Yorkshire town of Halifax, a great woolen centre, the local team play a Northern Cup tie against visiting Chesterfield. The ground, called the Shea, is set among the Pennine Hills. But though the weather is good, the result isn't, and to the disappointment of their supporters, the Halifax team is knocked out of the cup. In another cup tie at Manchester, under very different conditions, one of the city's clubs lose to Liverpool. Cup tie football, however, it's the surprises and the changes of fortune that make the competition so exciting. Liverpool, frequent cup finalists, are beaten by Little Chesterfield, who continue to confound the profits by knocking out team after team until they reach the semi-final. At Chesterfield itself, famous for its crooked spa, the whole town can think and talk nothing else but the chance of beating their rivals, Manchester United and so reaching the Northern Cup final. Everyone who can squeezes into the ground to cheer on the home team. It's a real North Country Cup tie, this. Hard knocks and every man all out for the whole game. But this time, the giant killers meet their masters. Chesterfield are beaten, and Manchester United scrape into the final by the only goal scored. The other club in the final is Bolton Wanderers, thrice winners of the FA Cup, pride of a great cotton manufacturing centre. A club with a long and honourable history known far and wide as the Trotters. The players are all out to win, they train hard. Running for stamina exercising each muscle to ensure suppleness. Goalkeeper fielding exercises to get that extra reach that may save a decisive goal. But gloom comes over Bolton when it's reported that the centre forward Lofthouse is unfit. Lofthouse, the promising young player who learned his football at the same school as Tommy Lawton, injured and unlikely to play. But the Bolton trainer works his magic, and his careful treatment is so effective that Lofthouse declares himself ready to play. He's given a trial, and he comes through successfully. On the day before the match, the news spreads through the town that Lofthouse is fit and will play. The sun shines again in Bolton. news that Lofthouse is fit cheers the whole town. It puts new heart and life into the team. The youngsters, to whom victory for Bolton at this moment is the most important thing in the world, will be talking, thinking, dreaming football, gathering in admiration before the shop windows, showing mementos of Bolton's great football past. All the north of England would like to be at this match. Many come from Manchester to crowd into the ground. Last time Bolton played Manchester in the Cup, 70,000 people were present. If Bolton's ground were twice as big as Wembley Stadium, it couldn't hold a small fraction of the enthusiasts who want to see this match. Most North Country clubs have supporters who eat, drink and sleep football, who express their wholehearted enthusiasm in open, exuberant display. It's part and parcel of the game.
Manchester United are working hard. But cup tie nerves affect players as well as spectators. And Manchester just can't get those girls. Can't afford to miss chances like that. In the second half, Bolton take their chances. It's a goal! Scored by Lofthouse, who so nearly didn't play. Bolton have won the North Cup. Climax of the Cup tie season in 1945 is the special match between the winners of the North Cup, Bolton Wanderers, and the winners of the South Cup, Chelsea, at the great Stamford Bridge Stadium in London. While the Bolton players have a look at the pitch before the match, the crowds are pouring into the ground in thousands. day and the pitch is in perfect condition as the two teams come out, Chelsea in blue, Bolton in white. Behind them, the officials carrying the ball, the referee, Commander Clark, and the linesman, Mr. Sadlier and Mr. Weir. The crowd now right on the tips of their toes with excitement. The referee shakes hands with the two captains. Harris, the Chelsea captain, tosses the coin. Who wins the toss? It's Chelsea. And they're going to play with the advantages of the sun, mainly behind their backs. Now here are the crowd waiting for the goal. Lining up in that centre circle are the three Bolton inside forwards, Lofthouse the centre forward, Hunt away on his far side, and Barris. Just waiting for the referee's whistle to start this unofficial championship match, and there it goes. Barris to Lofthouse, and the Bolton forwards try to force their way down into the Chelsea half. A clearance by a Chelsea halfback, volleyed very well indeed by the Bolton captain, up in the midfield, the inside forwards trying to get through, that's Golden, trying to put Machen through, but no, away come Bolton to Woodward, Woodward, Inside to veteran Hunt, but no, he can't get away. It's the halfbacks who've got the grip on this game at the moment. And here comes a long pass right out to Chelsea left winger Bain, the first exciting moment. Bain coming right across now, centre, across the goal, and oh, it's too hard. Well, that's the first thrill of the match. And the goal kick to Bolton and a narrow shave. Here comes Fielding, right footed, well upfield, and he sends his own forwards going right down into the Chelsea half. They're working the ball through as hard as they can. Chelsea halfbacks are tackling. Away comes the ball out to outside left, and the outside left right up into the Chelsea keeper's hands. So both goalkeepers have been in action, and now here come Chelsea racing away down. Another smart shot there, and it's pulled down by the Bolton keeper. Both sides right absolutely on the tips of their toes, and now here come Bolton again, forcing the pace. Chelsea right back, trying to stop the ball. No, he can't get it. He's put it back out to the winger. Here come Bolton on the attack. A centre right across the goal, and once again, straight into Black's hands, the Chelsea goalkeeper. Now here come, oh, two lovely dives. Magnificent saves there by Fielding. Goes right to the foot of those Chelsea forwards and sends it back up field again. Another clearance, this time by Bolton's right back. Plays going on very evenly this half, a nice golden shot, and Rook catches that ball from the golden shot, but Fielding goes down his knees. Another fine save by Fielding. Fielding is certainly saving the Bolton goal. Now he sends his forwards away, a long centre, goes right across, now here's Woodward on the Bolton right wing with it. What's he going to do? Can he get into the centre? Yes, no, it's only meant by Harris. Harris clears upfield, back it comes again, this time it's Hardwick, a long kick right away down, and he's going into the centre of the field now, there's Golden with the ball, he's pushing it right through now, Golden through to Rook, Rook's under a bleak angle and he shoots into the net, a beautiful goal there by Rook, Fielding tried to get his fingers to it, but he couldn't stop it, and Rook from close in has given Chelsea the lead after roughly half an hour's play, bad luck Fielding, you've made some fine saves, but are the Chelsea pensioners pleased? And rightly this should be Bolton kick off, but he's almost on half time, and half-time comes with the score, one nothing in Chelsea's favour. The teams turn round, and this time it's Chelsea's turn to kick off. Here they come right away, taking the ball down into the Bolton half, it's squared right across the goal, and the first man to handle is fielding the Bolton keeper. Here clears well up field. There's a scramble, and now here's Woodward racing with the ball down the Bolton right wing. He's been chased by Golden, will he get the ball across? Yes, he takes it right down the line, he squares it right across the Chelsea goal mouth, and he goes loose. Here's a scramble, and this time it's cleared by Harris. Here's Harris taking the ball upfield now, and another Chelsea attack being started. 
Uh, here's Rook, centre forward, trying to get through. Hamlet, both in centre half, clears nicely. Back he comes. Foss sends it up for Chelsea. And again, a Chelsea centre right up is pulled down underneath the Bolton bar. And now here's Lofthouse. Just missing a centre there by Hunt. Goalkeeper punched it round. There's Black punching down again. It only goes as far as Woodward. He tries to have another shot. But he's cleared, well cleared by the Chelsea defenders. And this time Hardwick has to kick off the line. Will they get an equaliser? Here he comes down. A punch through now. Hunt shoots. And as Black punched that ball forward, it went right onto Hunt's foot. And he's got the equaliser. After half an hour's play now, there's veteran Hunt with his ball head being patted by the Bolton players. Bolton have now equalised and the score is one all. One all, 15 minutes left for play, and here come Chelsea again. No, it's veteran Hunt who's got the ball. He's taking it away down now. He squares it across there. There's tense excitement all over this vast arena. Comes right through to Barris, and he's fouled in the penalty area. It's a penalty. A penalty to Bolton. Very few minutes left for play now. There's the ball in the spot. Hamlet, the centre half's going to take it. There's almost a deathly hush in the crowd. He comes, he shoots, and it's a goal. And he's given Bolton the lead. With very few minutes left for play, Bolton are now leading by two goals to one. There's Hamlet, the centre-half, being congratulated by his comrades, and the spectators are starting now to line the touchlines. Very few minutes left for play. They kick off again. Chelsea come away down the right wing, a long centre. It's over the goal, and gone behind, and with that, all Chelsea's hopes fade. The final whistle has gone, and here come the players now, streaming off the field after a very hard-fought 90 minutes, and they're just being mobbed by some of this 60,000 crowd who watched this match uh, here at Stamford Bridge. It's been a really thrilling game with the unofficial champions, Bolton Wanderers. Yes, Bolton is the team of the year. Now the youngsters will indeed treasure the autographs of the men who have proved themselves the best team in North and South of England. It's Bolton's big day, this. One that will be long remembered in the town, where the local folk turn out to greet their champions. Bolton is proud of its team and shows it. It was in such towns as these that association football grew up. It was from such people as the Bolton folk that it received its encouragement and its support. And the game that grew and flourished among the people of England is now played in every country of the world.